Hello, welcome. My name is Jean Sadaka, and I'm a museum educator at History Miami in downtown Miami. I have worked at the museum for five years and also I'm an architect. Welcome to our live virtual program, This is Miami. During this presentation, I will be sharing some images. And if you have any questions, please add them in the comment below and I will answer them as many as possible. So this installment is about living with water. Water is essential to life as we know it, to the environment used by people or influenced by the um, quality and quantity of water that is accessible to them. Historically, architectural designs have been about building to control water rather than embracing its qualities to live in harmony. And to this presentation, I will highlight some examples of this within the urban core of Miami specifically, but that is something that is um, prevalent in all cities across the world in addition to alternate, um, alternative design implementation that are more um, sustainable for this area. So if you guys can hear me, you can give me a thumbs up, um, you can put a comment, and then from there, I'm going to continue. So I'm going to wait for 30 seconds uh, to just give people, a few more people a little bit of time to join us, and then I'll get straight into the presentation. So once again, I will start in 30 seconds and then we are going to start the presentation. So in the meantime, if you can hear me, thumbs up, comment, so that we can know that everybody's actually tuned in and there's no problem. Okay, so countdown five, four, three, two, one. So once again, um, if you were to look at this image, this is a very iconic place in Miami. For those of you that are actually watching us online, that are not familiar with, you know, South Florida or Miami, this is a place I definitely recommend. So it's a very important place because it has a deep history in, in terms of Miami and in South Florida overall. So if you don't know where that is, I definitely recommend it as a musty destination in Miami. So we are going to go back to this image as well. But once again, if you're within your family, you can talk among them yourselves to, to find out, you know, what the name of this place is or where you think it actually is. So once again, as I mentioned, as part of the introduction, what is very um, essential to, to life itself and into the way we function in society. So if you are to look at this map of Florida, Florida is pretty much a land that's pretty much floating on water. So water is very, very essential to, the, um, to, to us down here, not just as you know, human beings, but to the you know, habitat that live here. So if you are to look at the tributaries of water that actually flows you know, from the state of, let's say, we have um, Alabama and Georgia to our north. There's a lot of those waters that actually um, lead to Florida. And obviously, as you can see, our biggest um, body of water is Lake Okeechobee, which is very essential to, to the um, rest of South Florida. So moving on, um, and when it comes to, once again, a built environment, um, when it comes to um, those architecture designs, I'm going to break it down what, you know, what the um, field really is about, whether you, know, you can say interior design, or let's say planning. So as long as we're able to, let's say, build environment and design, these are the, the core building blocks of what you know um, designers you know, think about. So for example, um, in the physical aspect of the architecture, there's two definitions that you can redefine the profession as, which is place, people, and design. When I say place, I'm referring to a, a physical um, um, place and environment. When I'm saying the people, the people that are live there and how that environment uh, affect them, and then eventually the design is actually influenced by, by both the environment and also the people that are making the decision that are living within that space. So from, from the design itself, um, if I had to go further into it into more detail, we have three other categories that you can go into where you know that design is informed in terms of three different um, principles, which is space, form, and order. So this is how pretty much, you know, um, let's say a project start, it, whether it's, in a, it's on a small scale, a big scale, or you know, like medium. So you have, you know, you have like, let's say a site scale, like just, you know, one building, one, one property. You have a community site that can actually affect, you know, a block, you know, just a very small district. Having a regional project that can be, you know, global. For example, we have Corona that's going on right now. That's, that's like a global thing that people have to wear a mask. So, you know, different projects have different, you know, um, effects on our society. So now to kind of bring it back to Florida specifically, you are actually seeing a zoning map of, let's say, um, our built environment of South Florida. So 
And this area over here to my left, let me just make a little note so you can actually see what I'm referring to. So here, when it says legend map, it's, show, it's showing you different views of, you know, of what the image to, to this side is actually um, um, informing you. So it's pretty much our building environment when they come to different um, land and how they are actually used. So if you were, if you were to think, think about it, there is not much of you know, room to spare within this you know, um, general area. So once again, I will make a little uh, scribble for you. So within this general area here, if you guys are following me, there's really not much, this big circle here, there's not much open spaces uh, um, within that, you know, within that. So you really, you don't really see water at all. So the only places that you actually see water, I'm going to clear this a little bit, and then it's actually on this edge over here. So this is, this is actually um, not a um, natural man-made lake, if you are wondering. These are actually quarries that, you know, we dug um, different materials when it comes to limestone to build, you know, our built environment, which you see on the other side. So uh, once again, within that space, um, if you had to pick up the map that I just showed you earlier, Florida is pretty much a land that is actually flowing open water, but a lot of this um, design decisions, you know, that were made, you know, were not made to actually include water. It was actually to keep water out. So I'm gonna go along with the presentation. So once again, if you have any comments, um, you know, feel free to um, give me a comment at the comment section and I can either um, answer them at the end of the presentation or as we go along before I go too far. So another big issue that we have here when it comes to, you know, living with water, trying to um, embrace the fact that, you know, Florida is pretty much surrounded mostly by water and in Florida, I mean, South Florida itself, you know, water is everywhere, is, a, is, is the problem of sea level, right? So that is something that is very common. Um, if you're not from this region of South Florida, sea level rise is a big issue around the world. So it's not just specific to Miami. But once again, I'm going to go into like why specifically in mind that's a very big problem. Um, when, I'm gonna start with um, li liquefaction. So liquefaction is actually a term that's used when, you know, soil it becomes very, very um, absorbent of water and then it can actually retain it to you know, density or property. So it becomes very, you know, um, um, liquidify in a sense. So that's actually what liquefaction is. And that's why a lot of places in this city, um, not, not just my, once again, Miami, Miami, yes, but South Florida in general, you have a lot of sinkholes because when you have you know, too much water within the ground, then the ground become unstable. So we have salt water um, intrusion as well as infiltration or intrusion. Um, that's another problem that we have there in Miami because a lot of the um, natural vegetation that we used to actually push salt water out, you know, are not actually there as in the natural defense barrier. So a lot of salt water actually come in with them, you know, or you know, urban forest actually become a problem, you know, even for us because we actually rely on fresh water. So if that fresh water is gone, then we have no way to actually get you know, fresh water. Um, and another reason why I can say I'm um, living with water in South Florida is a big issue where, um, as I mentioned earlier, we tend as designers or at least you know, previously before, before the thought of you know, sustainability and resiliency came to mind in terms of you know, designers, um, it was, a, it was a, a way to build, you know, to actually push water away as much as possible to control it. But you know, if you are to look at the properties of water itself, there's four different properties of it. And in those properties, you know, varies differently of how they actually um, affect our environment. So for example, you have a liquid, liquid is actually a physical thing that, you know, you can actually see, you can touch, um, you know, there's a temperature to it. So from the liquid, it goes to a gas, a gas you can't really actually um, control it, but you can to some extent at least see it um, you have conversation where the gas actually, you know, become, you know, some, another substance where it's kind of transformed. So, and then, of course, you have solid where you can think of, of ice, where it's true that we don't have snow over here. So that's really one of the, uh, one of the process of the phase, one of the phase of the process that doesn't really affect us as much to actually get, you know, um, liquid um, in terms of, you know, um, you know, snow or anything of that nature. But once again, because of these factors that, once again, um, liquefaction, some of it is, is man-made intervention and as well as, you know, the salt water infiltration. So that's like the man-made aspect of it based on some of our um, decision-making. And then, you know, the natural aspect is the phases that I mentioned earlier. So those phases, we can't really control them. 
So the more that we try to control those, you know, those phases, the more we actually affect ourselves to live here in, in a in a peaceful way without, you know, thinking, oh my God, there's a hurricane coming, you know, the sea level is gonna rise, or you know, if there's a storm coming, it's gonna get a lot of rain. So these are some of the issues that we face because we keep one area um so um so concentrated with water. And then when there's you know something natural so constantly that's happening, then that water really gets dispersed, you know, beyond our control. Whether you know if if the initial intent was to actually say, oh, you know, this is how we can actually keep things even. So that will actually help us with the um with the um, water problem that we have here. So I did mention a bit of habitat. So when it comes to South Florida, part of the reason why um, Florida is very unique or Miami itself, um, at least at one point in time, since you know, most of these habitats are kind of to the west. So it's because of the um, habitat. So if you are to take away from coast to coast, um, meaning from the east coast to the west coast, it seems to be a general trend of how these habitats are actually um, you know, arranged themselves. So, you know, from the ocean, the very bottom, you know, um, you have the coral reef. They pretty much are the very first defense to wave, you know, hitting the shore. And from the reef, you have the dunes. If you don't know dunes, so I'm going to highlight some of them for you um, as I um, go along. So when I mention a dune, this is what a dune, this is what it looks like. It's pretty much the very, very first primary of, you know, vegetation within, with, from shore from shore of the ocean. And then you have um, the this, this scrubs. Scrubs are pretty much, you know, small. So what you see is actually sea oats. Sea oats is very resilient to salt and they don't need that much water. That's why they actually very, um, very first in line to actually, um, you know, take roots. So in third, if you can see the, the number is there, um, you have scrubs. Scrubs are just, you know, smaller plants, but, you know, they're not just, you know, um, grass related. They are much more, you know, um, heavier. And then you have the mangoes. The mangoes are the big guys over here. As you can see, they are very, very unique in the sense that you see how the roots is actually coming out of the water. And that's what makes them very um, efficient in this environment when they go in hot water and in fresh water. And there's actually three types of mangoes that we have here in South Florida, which is the black, red, and then the white mangoes. So they got their name due to the color of the bark. And also the white mangoes actually produce a white little flower. And then from there, you have your um, your marshes. So between five and six, depending on the area, they may actually switch places. Um, it's because of the amount of land that's available for them to actually grow. So you can either get, you know, the a marsh area or swamp. And then you have your pine land. That's when you start getting, you know, trees such as um, pine trees that actually, you know, grow very, very tall. Once again, that, that shows you there's more nutrients in the soil for them to grow. That's why compared to, let's say, a pine land in a, in a dune, you have less of overall, let's say, size of a tree. And then your hardwood hammock or your, or your big canopy tree that, you know, if you were to go under it, it's pretty much a forest-like. So that's what, you know, the hardwood hammock is actually like. So these are all the habitat that that's pretty much very vital to water. And then as designers, if we do not design in a way to actually preserve them, then we actually gonna lose them because there's not, there's not much places around the world that actually have an environment that's you know like the one that we have here in Miami and South Florida. Um, part of the reason is because we have two very um interesting systems that actually connect and that actually meet in South Florida, which is the Gulf Stream as well as the um the jet stream from the north. So this is this is where they meet, and that's why it's pretty much a, a back and forth of the pole. So um that's the reason why this area is very unique. Um so let me just erase these annotations to continue. Uh, all right. So on, the, on our next slide, once again, you're gonna see some of the design decisions that were made, once again, for us to live there is a way to control water. The fact that Florida is pretty much a marshland of water. And then of course you have Lake Okeechobee, as you can see on the map, very visible. So in order for us to live there, you know, the decision was especially on World War, um, after World War II, where a lot of, you know, the um, soldiers, you know, they came to Florida, to, to Miami, um, to train before they were to go to their destination. So that actually spiked the, the a lot of you know people moving down south to Miami. So, but you know, the fact that there's pretty much just mosquitoes and alligators down here. So people had to kind of find a way to remove themselves from you know the the brutal the brutalness of the you know of nature. So they did some drainage um, you know, from the lake, as you can see here, um, you know, from the bottom here, they went to different directions to actually. Um, control. So the very southern part of the lake, 
uh, which I'm going to highlight once again for my viewers so that you, I do not lose you. So at the very bottom here, um, this is like the delegate area. It's very productive in terms of agriculture and farming and, and livestock. So that's what they use the water down there for. And of course, you know, the rest is pretty much to drain it from down here. So um, industrial farming was a big thing to the to the drainage of you know the everglade overall. Where the everglade that we know today is not the everglade that, that it is today. It was actually much more bigger, uh, which I'm going to go into on, on our next slide. So once again, let me just clear this out. Okay, next. So now, once again, you just saw a lot of the habitats that I mentioned, there's eight of them, and they are very um, unique to this environment. But once again, due to design decisions that are made, um, environmental issues were not um, part of the, you know, the key element to kind of consider. So now today we are left with, you know, the everglade that you see on the southern tip of the map here. And then you have the big cypress to the north, you know, that has, you know, a little bit of this. So you can really say only about 10% of what um, or what you know this South Florida, this Miami needs to be that's left of it because you know from the lake of from Lake Okeechobee, you know, all the way down, it was not just on the south um, western part of South Florida. All of that was pretty much the same habitat, you know, from coast to coast. But obviously, like I said, um, because of you know urbanization, which you can kind of see here from the map, if you have to kind of go along the edges, um, where you see, for example, 595 and you see um the turnpike and so on, and you know. Is it Okeechobee or Highway 27? You really see a very, a very um, compacted, you know, environment. And then once again, there are there are reasons why it's so compacted due to let's say advancement in technology and to you know building design. But once again, um, as designers of today, it is our duty to actually preserve, you know, what the little that we have left. Because once again, um, this is an, an environment that's very unique to to what we have. So once again, water is something, as you can see, once again, you can't really escape water. You know, instead of trying to control water, you let's find a way to mitigate and find a way to live, you know, peacefully with water. Um, so this is pretty much our urban core today. For example, this is an image of Miami. You actually are looking at downtown Miami, downtown pretty much, you know, the core. So it's pretty much a view looking from, um, from the safety system on the, on the northern side, you look in south, east of Miami. So if you are to see like, um, just to give you a bit of orientation, I'm going to orient you exactly what this view is actually show, showcasing here. Um, draw here. So pretty much over here, this is Key Biscayne over here. So if you are to cross here, you're gonna get, you know, Miami Beach. So that's that, that area you're actually seeing. So this is actually um, the museum where we are located. So for those of you that are familiar with, you know, Miami, if you wonder where, where are you, the is to Miami there. Um, another place I can highlight is the um, government center over here. And then down here, you have our very famous um, courthouse. It's very iconic. If you have not been there, definitely recommend it. They also have a free library there, just to let you know if you're not, you know, local. even if you are, but if you don't know, I definitely recommend you to check the library at the courthouse. It's, it's a public um, space. So feel free to actually so let me just stop for a second to answer a, a question um, from one of our viewers. How come in on mangoes in the rest of the world? Okay, so mangoes um they typically live in you know one region of the world, you know, pretty much around the equator. I know the other uh, place um in SA area that has the most amount of mangoes is actually in southeastern Asia because they're um the same for example, we have you know the cold air coming from the north and we have you know the southern air coming from the south. They do have that same let's say system as well so you know that actually allows you know, the mangoes to, to thrive so another question is will the ele elevated highway on the tamiami trail going to help with water distribution um it's a start it's not really going to um solve the entire problem but i can really say um to go to answer that question a bit further if you're to look at our, at our um, urban spaces or building calls again um, just from this image alone, where um, if I had to highlight this area here, I don't know if you guys can see what actually highlighting, it's a parking space. So when it comes to once again highways, if you have to combine highways as well as you know per surf um, surfaces, when I say per surfaces, I'm specifically referring to parking lots. Um, that's actually 25% of our total surface area that we have that's actually paved with concrete. So if you don't know, um, concrete is not um, is not very porous. 
So once, you know, water is actually on a concrete, it will stay there until it literally evaporates or, you know, you remove it. So with that being said, um, yes, you can say to some, maybe maybe the, the elevated highway may affect just that specific area that it's in to actually let the water, you know, run its course, you know, from the ground, you know, from the air to the ground. Um, but it's not really going to solve the topology of the problem because once again, if you are to look at this urban core, you see it's very, very dense. Um, you don't really see any sign of water here except for the water bodies that we have this in day and of course, you know, the Atlantic Ocean that you see here. Um, so you don't really get um, that much. So I know our time is almost short, so I'm going to go back where I actually started the presentation, which is, uh, one second, let me just, once again, take this people out. All right, so now we are actually going to go back where we started. So I did mention about this picture. So if you don't know, this is, this is Stillsville. This is actually in terms of design. Um, it was not built, you know, anything. Let's say, um, at that time for sustainability purposes. But if you were to look at uh, at our urban core today in our fabric, this is one of the precedents that I can actually say that actually fit, you know, how we can actually live with water, you know, in a very peaceful way. Where what happened is that if you take off steel, steel is not very resilient to salt. When you are still underwater, it actually decomposes um, very very fast. But you know, wood actually. The, the opposite happened because there's a process called petrification. So what happened is that the fact that the wood is underwater, there is less, um, I see more questions, I'll get to them very quickly. So there is less, um, there is less, um, there's less uh, exposure to oxygen. So by, by the fact that there's less oxygen for bacteria and fungi to grow and you know, multiply to actually eat the, the material of the wood, um, that process actually provides a coating and if we're to design for the environment today, you know, from the, the same aspect as still, as you can see, it's elevated. So that actually gives you know, the water, you know, ways to actually go back and forth. And also, you know, today there's more, there's more, you know, um, um, sound um, design implementation. When it comes to how you can actually protect the wood, there's, you know, pressure treated wood, you can actually do that. And you can also um, coat the wood with different coating, you know, to actually, you know, make it very, very strong. So once again, even if, if those, you know, natural man-made implementation were to go away, just you know, the wood natural power property itself, once the coating were to finish or like the air pressure to it within the wood is gone, you know, now the natural process of the wood actually um, through um, petrification can actually preserve it. So we do have probably about five to seven minutes. So if you have not have a chance to ask a question yet, this is gonna be your time. And also this is the first phase of the, of, of you know, um, this is Miami. They're gonna be producing, this is not, you know, a one-time thing. So feel free to spin in for our next session. So now let me just answer some few questions before our time is over here. So we have about seven more minutes. So how will sea level rise affect specific communities in Miami? So once again, different communities have different elevation. If you think of, let's say, um, Florida overall, the average elevation is about five to um, five feet to 10 feet. So for example, we have the ridge. The ridge is very, very high compared to most of this in um, Florida. It's about 13 to um, um, 13 to 15 feet high in some areas. So those people are not really impacted as much. And if you are to look at you know, um, records, um, usually those, those areas are much more um, um, expensive to live in, obviously, because you may be protected from the, from the lower land. So yes, if the sea level were to rise let's say within point two to five feet, there's a lot of people that will have, they will have to sell their houses to move on, unfortunately. Once again, I, I actually allude to the fact that our natural barriers are not actually there anymore to actually absorb water for us. Okay, another question says, um, ask, what are some of your favorite design? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good and a hard question. I can say my, my favorite design um, is a type of um, architecture called Baroque architecture. Um, it's very elegant and um, I would say very like up there, upscale. But part of the reason because, you know, when that style came to be, it was a lot of war between um, kings and queens and England that are trying to show, you know, how much money they are with. So it does build design. They were very hard to replicate today, even with the technology that we have, because they were they were very costly, and you know you really had to be you know on top of the game as not just as an architect, as a um, you know designer like an artist to actually um, to um, to for them to commission you to the work. Um, let's see, solution in Miami that Miami did that are better about living with water. I mean, once again, um, now there's um, there are more 
there are more conversation about, okay, how we can, you know, live. Um, one thing is, let's say, for me, the surfaces, where you might go to, let's say, a, a plaza or open space, you might see within the trees, they actually have um, mulch. They actually have mulch to actually help absorb the water, where, once again, if you take most of all, you know, like streets, um, once the water is actually on the surface, it, it, it find a, you know, a slope, you know, a slope to actually, you know, go to, let's say, a drain. Um, so it really, uh, it really is um, not, not visible as, as much as we are um, within water. Um, so when it comes to um, design decisions that can be made, it really start, I really think, once again, with the natural defense system um, that we have, for example, most of our shores are not what they used to be. When, like I mentioned before, the mangroves, the mangroves is a very essential thing to our environment down here. And in the dunes as well, um, we, most of our dunes are actually um, restoration dunes, to be honest. They are not in you know, the natural doom. So even with that, um, you know, I think you know some areas in Miami actually try to put an effort to uh, to to bring the dunes back. So I commend them for that. Um, but once again, and it's gonna take all of us. It's not gonna be just you know the designers that are making the decisions because at the end of the day, it is up to the people in the community to actually dictate what their community look like. Um, if if you're not involved in you know community outreaches as far as let's say organization. Um, that's one way you can actually um, make your voice be heard. Um, and then just be just be in the know in a city. You, know, you have to know if you live in an area, especially in Miami, the fact that once again, water is everywhere around you. You have to know exactly where you live because you might live in a place that's actually susceptible to flooding and you don't know. So what happened when a hurricane comes or you know, there's a flood? I remember the last hurricane that we have, I think it was in a year, if I remember correctly. Brick was actually underwater for at least like five feet. A lot of people had to close their stores. So, um, so yeah, some areas will definitely be affected. How does the deal environment affect health of a community? Well, once again, the um, if you think of this, the heat index, um, the heat index in Miami is very, very, very high because yes, we have the wind, you know, that kind of provide a breeze, but a lot of our buildings actually block the natural air that we will get from the east or from the west. So from the West, it's pretty much low, low, mostly low rises. But you know, from let's say Miami Beach, from the um, from the uh, from the islands, the very islands, all the way to the mainland, you know, most of that you know natural uh, air passageway is actually you know kind of um, kind of kind of like you know trap the air, trap trap the coolness of the air. So if you have to think, let's say historically, most of our water or, or rain it actually moved to the west. It moved to the west because once again, with the fact that you know the heat index in the middle of the sea, the core sea, like some like I show you right now, you know, actually remove uh, remove you know let's say fresh air from coming in. So on, when it comes to our built environments, let me the question of our health. So if we're to have cool, cooler spaces, you know, it would be very 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 healthier because you know with with trees, um, the trees will provide a lot of shade. You know, once again, another thing that can help as well when it comes to health is you actually, you know, um, have put more of a community market or have places that actually, uh, you know, plant things, you know, let's say like community gardening. It's something that is, is so small, but it, 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 if you think of a city, you know, an urban core area, it, it goes, it goes so, it goes a long way, a long way. Um, one city that, that, are, that are doing that very well, if you visit, is actually, um, and in Canada, Montreal. So they use a system where, you know, for every three to five blocks, you're gonna get a small community garden. Where it may not seem, seem more, but you know, on the overall health of the people, it helps you to meditate, you can go to the jog. And of course, you know, it, it saves it helps you save, you know, money. Where if you need let's say a cabbage or a small potato, you know, at least probably once a month, you can go to a local community garden and then you get it yourself. So in terms of you know our building environment, there are so many ways that we can actually um, make it work. Um, I'm not saying the way that we live right now is you know completely outrageous, but if you had to look once again as I you know at Stillsville because it's still actually standing. Um, yes, there were more buildings that we can understand. You know, over time things actually um, you know fall apart if there's no maintenance to actually maintain them. So those that we have, you know, they were actually maintained. And plus, they're actually right in the middle of the path of a hurricane, but actually the entire floor is in the path of a hurricane. But you can kind of see once again to go back to the, uh, the theme of you know, living with water, of how we can actually live 
with water. Um, this is a possibility where, you know, I'm not saying the entire city could have looked like Stillsville, but you can say maybe 25%. And then if at least 25% of mining were to be like this, we would have a much more cool environment, a much more safe environment to actually live in. And then, you know, to actually embrace the water, you know, it's, it's all the way around you. You can't really escape from it. Um, if, if water is not for you, if you cannot swim, one solution you can learn how to swim, but if not, it's not for you, then South Florida is not for you. But I feel like, you know, um, there are not just I feel, but I really um, know that in terms of, you know, design, how you approach, you know, a specific environment, if you are to build, you know, based on the um, context and based on the material that's available to you as well, then, you know, um, both parties can benefit, you know, the humans that are living there, the environment itself, and as well as, you know, the habitats that actually make up that environment. So that's pretty much what I have to say. If you want to uh, continue this conversation, um, you can feel free to reach out to me um, at KSU Miami. And once again, this is um, a continuation that we're going to be doing. It's not the first, and it won't be the last. And thank you very much for your time, because my time is up. Take care. Goodbye.